Uh, before I begin, I wanted to thank Benji Eisenberg from the Pesach program and Mr. Yaakov Kessler from the Ramada Hotel for inviting me to come speak and to hosting this event. And special thanks to Nisano for schlepping out here on Cholomayid to record this lecture, shir, drosha, whatever you want to call it. Um, let me introduce you to the wonderful field of Jewish onomastics. Okay? Um, onomastics is the study of names. Looking into things about like you know, where do names come from, what language it comes from, you know, where and when the name came about, where and when the name was popular, what does the name literally mean, different famous people that bore that name in particular. So Jewish onomastics is the study of Jewish names and all of these types of questions regarding Jewish names. I particularly find it an interesting topic to, to think about because it represents the intersection of a lot of different interesting fields that I find interesting because they're interesting, right? <laughs> uh, for example, you know, it's the intersection of history, archaeology, linguistics, etymology, and then of course on the other hand, halacha, minhagim, uh, tanakh, chazal, and things like that as well. You know, the halacha talks about things like how to spell names for a get, when you give a name, there's different minhagim. You know, for a boy, you give a name by a bris. For a girl, you give a name when a father gets an aliyah. Who to name after, who not to name after. You know, if a person is a rasha, we try not to give such names. Who, which, which, which parent gets to choose the name. There's all kinds of halachas, minhagim, all different sorts of things related to names. And then there's the historical aspect of names. And all this together makes up the interesting field of Jewish onomastics. So today we're going to speak about a specific subcategory uh, in, in, in Jewish onomastics, a small aspect of Jewish onomastics, and that is the concept of a theophoric name. Okay, what is a theophoric name? A theophoric name is a personal name, or what we call a first name or a given name, that has a theophoric reference. Theophoric reference is a reference to God, to a reference to Hashem. Theo is the, the Greek term for God. Right? You have, in Theo is related to, in, in Latin is Deus or Dio. Right? That, that, that's the etymological ancestor of the, Engl of the English word divine. So a theophoric name is a name that has, in, in the personal name, is a reference to God, a reference to Hashem. I'll give a, lot of, a bunch of different examples just to illustrate the point, but that, that's basically the structure of the name, is that there's, uh, let's say if we're talking about a Hebrew theophoric name, so there'll be some sort of inflection of a, of a, of a, of a sharish, of a three-letter sharish, usually roots in Lashon HaKadosh are three letters, like a three-letter sharish, and then some element of the name that's related to one of the names of Hashem. Okay. So, so that's what a theophoric name is. I'll, let, let, let's give you some, some examples just to illustrate the point. Right? So the most common theophoric names in Tanakh possibly are names that are related to the Shem Hashem of Yud Ke Vav Ke. So you'll have names like, you know, we, where you'll, you'll have three out of four letters of Yud Ke Vav Ke at the beginning of, the, of a personal name. Names like Yehoshua, Yehoyada, Yehosheva. Right, so Yehoshua is a combination of yud Hey vav the first three of the four letters of Hashem's name, and then the root shin vav ayin which means like salvation. And then you have Yehoyada, which is the same thing. It's a three out of four letters of Hashem's name. And then yud dalet ayin which refers to knowledge or knowing something. Then Yehosheva, uh, it's hard to know exactly what Yehosheva means. It's a, it's a girl's name in Tanakh. Um, she was one of the people involved in saving Yoash HaMalach. So, he, what? Case Ko. Kastya. Yeah, what about it? It's a name. Could be. I just learned it today, the Gemara. And, and, Don't your names, whether they're. And, yeah, Psach of Kufi and Zayin Amidal, if the Gemara discusses whether, whether Case Ka is one word or two words. Right. The, the, the Gemara doesn't say it's a name. The Gemara is just discussing whether it's one word or two words. Some but, of them, the Gemara says, is a name over there. Um, but uh, yeah, so Yehosheva is made up of you know, three out of four letters of the Hashem's four letter name, and then Sherish Shin Beis Ayin, which means num maybe the number seven, maybe it means swearing or taking an oath, or maybe it means something else. Not clear exactly what it means in this context. And then you have certain theophoric names where 
you have the you have the Shoresh, and then at the end of the name you have three or f- three out of four letters of Hashem's name. So you have like Yirmiyahu. So you have like the Shoresh. His name is probably the Shoresh is probably Reish Mem or Reish Vav Mem, which means like to lift up. And then Yahu at the end is the reference to Hashem. Or you have Adoni Yahu. So you have Aleph Dalad Nun, which means like Lord or Master. And then the Yahu part is a reference to Hashem. Or Ben Yahu. So you have the Ben, which is like the Son of. And then Yod, Yod Hey Vav, which is a reference to Hashem. Or you have the name Asal Yahu, which we'll speak about in a moment, what exactly the, the name might mean. But it's the same thing. It seems to be derived of a three letter Sherish of Ayin Taf Lamed. And then it has the, the Yahu part, which is a reference to Hashem. And then sometimes you actually, you have instead of, the, instead of like Yeho something as, part, as the beginning of the first name, you have Yo something. Right? So you have Yo Chaved, which is Yud Vav. So it's two letters of Hashem's name, but not, 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 not in, in, the, in consecutive order of Yud and then Hey and then Vav. It's Yud Vav, like skipping the Hey. So Yo Chaved, which is Hashem's name. Plus the root kaf beis dalid, which means heavy or it means honor. Yo ram, which is similar to Yirmiyahu. It's going to be related to the, the Sherish Resh Mem, which means to lift up. And then the Yud Vav element of Hashem's name. So Yo ram, Yo Av, which is uh, you know, Yo Av Ben Surya, who, uh, who was one of uh, David Malach's generals. So it's the Yud Vav. You have the Yud Vav from Hashem's name, and then the word Av, which means father. Yo Sam which is Yud Vav of Hashem's name, and then the word Tam, which is like pure, or innocent, or complete. So you have all these, you have, you have different ways that theophoric names could, could come about, different permutations of how a theophoric name can, can, you know, can be developed with, the, with, with this sort of formula of, of you know, Hashem's name, and then a three-letter Shash. Then you have also other names of Hashem, like if you have the name Kel, Right, Aleph Lamed. So you have names of Hashem. The, the, you, you have na- theophoric names that use the 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 el the kel element. Right, so you have Eliezer. So Eliezer is kel, Aleph Lamed, right? And then the yud, the possessive yud, I guess it would be right. So it would be like my kel is Ezer Ein Zayin Reish, which is you know help or aid or something like that. Eli Melech is the same idea. Aleph Lamed with the possessive yud. So it's like my kel. Melech, he's the king. My, my God is the king. My Hashem is the king. El Hanan, the same idea. Hash, Kel, it's referring to Hashem. Hanan, he's gracious. He's the one who grants us things. El Kana, he's the one who... Kana is like, maybe it means a reed, or maybe it means he possesses, he owns things. El Yashiv, he who returns people. Right? That's like a, maybe a prayer for... You know, after Klai Yisrael went into Golos, so you say El Yashiv, you want, this Hashem to return the Jews to the, to the original place. You have, so you have the El element in the beginning of the name, and you also have the El element at the end of the name. Yishmael, right? Hashem will listen. You, so you have the Yishma and then the El. Yisrael, you have the El at the end. You have Malki El. Malki El is my king, is El. Yirachmi El, right? So he'll have mercy, and then El. Gamliel, so Gamal means to, to, to provide or to give something, but it also has the exact opposite meaning. It means to stop providing. When a, when a child is weaned, it's a vayi gomel, right? So Gamal means to give or to, to, or to not give. So, but Gamliel is, you know, Hashem is the one who provides. So we have um, the, the four letter name of Hashem, we have the name Kel, we have the name Shakai also expressed in the theophoric names. Two examples, in, there's only two examples in Tanakh as far uh, off the head, top of my head right now. Shadeor, right? So it's Shadeor. Um, <clears throat> so Shadeor is, is, you know, Shem Shakai and then Or, which is light. Or Tsuri Shaddai. So Tsuri is like my rock, or like, which means like my savior, my helper, is Shakai, is the Shem Hashem of Shakai. So you have all these different ways of, of how to put together uh, a theophoric name with a divine element, the theophoric element that refers to Hashem, and then you know, a more common word, and then you put, you put them together. There are actually cases of double theophoric names. Um, two examples of that are the name Eliyahu. So you have the Kel, and then you also have a Yahu. So like the whole name is just a reference to Hashem. Kel and Yahu. And then you have the opposite. You have Yoel. Right, so Yoel is Yud Vav, reference to Hashem, and then, and then Kel, a reference to Hashem as well. So they have like a double theophoric name. It's interesting that we never have 
a theophoric name that uses all four letters of Hashem's name. Right? If we're using the four letter name, we're using only three out of four letters. We're not putting all four letters together because that, you know, Hashem's name is a holy name. We don't use it for you know, mundane purposes. If you, you can end up saying, like, yo, Eliyahu passed the milk, but if you want to use Hashem's name, you're going to be saying, like, Eli, you know, pass the milk. You can't, it doesn't, it doesn't it's pasnished. So we don't, we don't use all four letters together in, 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 a, in a person's personal name, but we do use two letters, three letters. Okay. That's. A name, a name like Yehuda has all four letters in it. Yeah, a name like Yehuda does have all four letters in it. And. And it, it, it's it's debatable exactly what the name, what the origin of the name, what the etymology of the name Yehuda is, how to parse it. But the hey at the end is not part of the of the yud hey vav in the beginning. Right? The hey at the end is probably probably the sherish of the of the word to admit is dalit yud dalit hey or or yeah toda is a, is a is an inflection of the sherish yud dalit hey, which means to to give thanks. Uh, so the the hey at the end there is is related to the let's call it the whole part of the theophoric name. So, uh, so there's a lot of different examples of theophoric names. Um, uh, most of them are in Tanakh. There are examples of theophoric names that are not in Tanakh. It's not true. There are examples of theophoric names that are not in Tanakh. Um, for what about the minute of uh, somebody writes his name, he puts Aleph. Instead of, doesn't have to have a Right, because yeah, some people have a minute that they want to be mocked even when they're writing a, a personal name, so they don't want to. They don't want to write the Aleph Lamed together because they're, you know, it, it might be a problem of writing Hashem's name, so they, you know, they put like an Aleph and like a little line or something like that. Yeah, there, there's such a, there's I such. Do that. What? I do that. Oh, you do that. Rabbi Nassanel does that. Okay, yeah, there, there's such a there's such a meaning. I think most people aren't mocked on that. Or if the name is like Eli, uh, if the name is like Yehoshua, so like maybe they'll make a, a line between the Yud and the Hey, right? But nobody pronounces it as like Keli Keliahu or something like that. That that's already like taking it too far. Or Keli Kahu, right? That, that's the joke. And my siblings, one of the teens, we so call me Sanko. The Sanko, yeah. yeah. That's uh, so we do have examples of, of theophoric names that are, don't come from Tanakh. For example, Sadia. Um, so Sadia is a theophoric name. It's related to the Shurish Samach Ayin Dalid, which means to satisfy or to, to provide a meal, like Su'uda. Right? And, then yud, yud, and then the yud Hey element of Hashem's name. That name doesn't appear in Tanakh, but it does appear you know, in later sources. We have Rav Sadia Goin in the 900s. So you know it's it, it's it's a later it's a later development. So w w one of the interesting things to think about when you think about theophoric names is like what what is what does it mean like what what are we trying to say with the theophoric name? So it, in in any given situation, it's hard to know exactly what the original intent was. But there's several there's several there's several themes that we could sort of say from it. W one idea is that. A theophoric name might be a parent's way of expressing their trust or their belief in Hashem. They're declaring it and, and they're saying, Chizkiyahu, Hashem is chazak, Hashem is strong. Or, or Uziyahu, you know, Hashem is strong. Or, you know, Yehu Yada, Hashem knows everything. Right, so that, 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 that's one idea. Maybe like the parent is trying to instill that conviction in their child by giving it to their name. Uh, you, like I said yesterday, your name is something you take with you wherever you go. So you know, wherever you go, you have this idea in your head, oh, Hashem is strong. Hashem is, you know, this is my conception of Hashem. So maybe it's you know, a sort of a parental pedagogical technique. You could say it like that. Or it's my, the parent's own declaration. Or you can say... Uh, Theophoric names are sometimes a way of expressing thanks to Hashem for something that happened in the past. Like the Torah says that, that Hagar called, Hagar was supposed to call her son Yishmael, Ki Shema Hashem El Onyech. Hashem listened to your, your, to, to, your, to your struggle. Hashem listened to your affliction. Right? So that's a hap, something that happened in the past. Because Hashem listened to me in the past, so I'm going to name him Yishmael to commemorate and to mark that and to, to, to give my thanksgiving to Hashem in this way. Another, we, another, I already alluded to this before, is that maybe a theophoric name could be a prayer for the future. Like Eliyashiv, you're saying that Hashem is the God who will ret return us to our land. So that is something like 
it, it's not something that I'm saying now, and it's not something that I'm t- trying to teach per se, and I'm not, it's not something related to the past, but it's something that I'm hoping for for the future. I'm asking Hashem to do this. Like Rashi says, when Moshe Rabbeinu called Hoshea bin Nun Yehoshua, so, so Moshe Rabbeinu said, Hashem should save you from the advice, from the plot of the Miraglim, of the, of the spies. So there Moshe Rabbeinu was praying in a way, he was, he was asking Hashem to do something in the future by giving this name. So you, you, have, you, so you have elements of past, present, and future in, why the, in the why question of, of theophoric names. I said before, I mentioned the name of Saliyahu. So Asaliyahu was the name of the only queen that's mentioned in Tanakh, Jewish queen that's mentioned in Tanakh over the Jewish people. Right? She was the queen of Malchus Yehuda after, after, after her husband and her son were killed or died. So she took over the kingship and she was not such a, such a good person. She was Ivan of Adazara and she was doing all kinds of kishuf and she was trying to kill out the whole family of Malchus based David. But from our perspective, we're just looking at her name. So we don't have to... You know, what, what does her name mean? Asal Yahu. So there's a sher- so I, the way I said it before was you know, we have the Sheresh Ayin Taf Lamed, and then the, the Yahu part, which is a reference to Hashem. But what's the Sheresh Ayin Taf Lamed? You pick up the Radak wrote Sefer Sharashim, or Ibn Janach wrote Sefer Sharashim, you look it up, page through it, there's no such thing as the Sheresh Ayin Taf Lamed. So what, how could you say, what does Asal Yahu mean if there's no Sheresh Ayin Taf Lamed? Okay? Um, the same question I had, what, the second to last king of Malchus Yisrael, his name was Pekach ben Ramaliyahu. Okay? Ramaliyahu, using our, you know, our, our way of, under, of parsing theophoric names. So you have Ramaliyahu, the Sherish Resh Mem Lamed, and then the Yahu element, which is a reference to Hashem. But what's Sherish Resh Mem Lamed? There's no such thing as a Sherish Resh Mem Lamed. Mm-hmm. You look in the Sifre Sherashim, there's no such thing. So what does it mean? So, <clears throat> so this is the type of question that bothers me because I'm interested in Jewish onomastics. So I was looking, I looked, I couldn't find anything about it. I couldn't find any swarm. I sent an email. There's a professor in Rutgers University in, in New Jersey. His name is Gary Rensberg. He's an expert in Semitic languages. So Semitic languages is, you know, li- linguists have this theory that languages are related to each other in what they call language families. Okay, so Hebrew is a member of the Semitic language family. And there's other Semitic languages also that are related to Hebrew, like Aramaic, like Arabic, like Ethiopic, like Giz, like Ugaritic, possibly Akkadian. There's different other Semitic languages that are, that are related, but not quite, not quite the same thing. So I asked this Professor Rensberg, I said, you know, I, for, as far as I know, there's no, there's no such Sherish Ayn Taf Lamed in Lashon HaKadosh. Maybe you know of some other Semitic language you know, where Ayin Taf Lamed has some sort of meaning. He wrote me back, no, there's no such thing. There's, there's no Semitic language, that means there's no language that's even closely related to Lashon HaKadosh that has a Sherish that's related to Ayin Taf Lamed. So what he wrote is, he's positive or he's hopeful that in the future we're going to discover another Semitic language and then in that Semitic language we'll find some sort of cognate of the Sherish Ayn Taf Lamed and Lashon HaKadosh and from that we'll be able to figure out what it means and you know the name Asal Yahu we don't know what it means but hopefully in the future you know linguists will be able to figure it out based on some other un- hitherto undiscovered language. That's what Professor Rensberg wrote to me. I guess the same would apply to the name Ramal Yahu. Um, one of the hats, one of the many hats that I wear is I'm an editor for, for um, what's called the Verom Emanu Foundation. The Verom Emanu Foundation was founded by Rabbi Yeshua Steinberg from Telstone and it's dedicated to publishing different works about Lashon HaKadosh and doing research on Lashon HaKadosh and doing all kinds of, we're work, they're working, one of the projects is you know, a new edition of the Sefer Sharashim of the Radak and Menachem, and different things like that. And so I turned to my boss at the Verama Manu Foundation, you know, like Verama Manu we call Ashran, get it? Verama Manu. So, so I, I turned to Rabbi Steinberg from the Verama Manu Foundation, and he said, he said a different approach. He said, Asal Yahu, you have to parse the name differently. It's not a three-letter Sherish. It's a two-letter Sherish, and then it's a Lamed prefix, and then there's a Shem Hashem. So it's Ayin Tuf, means time, right? And then Lamed, like the prefix Lamed, like two. 
and then uh, Yahu of Hashem. So Eis, Asal Yahu is like Eis le Hashem, like a time for Hashem. That's how he wanted it. And he, he, he looked into it, he actually found some sources that allude to this idea. <clears throat> I think it was the Ramami Panu seem, seemed to say such a thing. That, that, that's, how to, that's how we should understand the name Asal Yahu. And then he wanted to say the same thing with Ramal Yahu, that Ramal Yahu don't understand it as a three letter shirish of Reish Mamad, Reish Mamad, Reish Mamad, Reish Mamad, and then Yahu. Rather, you should understand it as Reish Mem, to, to lift up, and then Le for, for Yahu, for Hashem. You're, you're lifting something up for Hashem, Ramal Yahu. So that, that, that's a different approaches of how, how to put it together. Um, so, uh, well, I wanted to talk about you know, a few different things in Tanakh, a few different episodes in Tanakh, that if we have this paradigm of theophoric names in mind, it can help us enhance our understanding of what was going on in the, in the story, and you know, bring, 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 a, bring out new points that you might have not realized, you might not have thought about, unless you had you know, realized that there's, there's, such a, you know, there's such a model of naming convention in, in, in biblical character names. So one story has to do with the son of Yoshiahu HaMelech. This story, if, if you're familiar with Yoshiahu HaMelech in Sefer Malachim, so Yoshiahu HaMelech came, be, became king at a time when idolatry was already endemic in Malchus Yehuda. He's, a, he's coming about in a time where the ten tribes were already sent into Gullus through the king of Ashur, and he, he's just the Malach Yehuda that's left, and Kla Yisrael is going downhill, they're doing Avedah Zarah, and the prophets, there's three famous prophets who were prophesizing in his time, Yirmiyahu, Tzfania, and Chulda Hanaviyah. We're all prophesizing doom, doom and destruction forthcoming, and Yoshiahu HaMelech was anti-idolatry. He tried to do whatever he can to fight against the Vedas to, to 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 undercut the trend that was that was that was going downhill. But it was an example of what we call too little, too late. He tried as much as he could, but he he, he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't Matziach and, and you know. The people kept worshipping Avayda Zara. There's a measure that says that you know, he used to send out soldiers to check to make sure that people weren't doing Avayda Zara in their house. So what do they do? They put, they put the Avayda Zara behind the door so that the guards wouldn't be able to see it. And then when the guards left, they went, they closed the door and they were, they were worshipping their Avayda Zara. Right? So that's the tragic story of Yoshiel Wamelech. But he, he thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was on the right track. But it was, as I said, too little, too late. And at that time, as in many junctures in history, uh, the land of Israel was stuck in between two major superpowers. It was stuck in between, at that time, the kingdom of Ashur and Egypt. Those were the two major superpowers, and they were fighting each other. They were going to war with each other. And the king, of, the king of Egypt, his name was Paro Nechal, the handicapped Paro. So he he sent he, you know, he sent a message to Yoshio Amalek, and he said, "I want to be able to use your land, to travel through your land." You know, Go through Eretz Yisrael to get to go to go fight with the, with, with the king of to go fight with the Assyrians, and Yirmiyahu and Navi comes to Yoshiyahu and he says, "Yes, it's a good idea. Let him do it. Let him do it." And Yoshiyahu Malk says, "No, one second, one second, one second. It Says in the Torah, by the brachas that when Klal Yisrael is doing the right thing, it says, A sword will not pass through your land." And we're doing the right thing. We're, we have this anti avid Zara campaign. Look what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm turning the tides against avid Zara. I'm doing the right thing. I think that we should not let him go through. And he disagreed with Yirmiyahu and Avi. And he said, no, Mr. Paro, I'm not letting you guys go through my land to go fight the Assyrians. And Paro said, oh yeah, I'll show you. Right? And he, so he comes and he invades Eretz, uh, Malchus Yehuda. And there's a war that's ensued, and Yoshiyahu is very badly injured, and his parting words, according to Chazal, are immortalized in Sefer Eicha. Tzadik hu Hashem kifi hu marisi. Hashem is righteous because I have rebelled, or I have transgressed His word. The, the Navi said not to, let your, not to let the Egyptians through, and I, I didn't listen to the Navi. So he had charata yes. then. What? The Navi said, said to yes. let them. The, the said to let him through, and I didn't listen to the Navi, and you know, that, that was, those were his, his his last words. That's the tragic story of Yeshiahu Amelach. So after Yeshiahu Amelach dies in this battle, comes along Paro Necho, and he says, "Okay, you know who's going to be king of Machlis Yehuda next? Yeshiahu's son." But then he's replaced. So Yeshiahu is replaced by his son Yehoahaz for three months. 
And then after three months, Paru Nachal says, "You know what? I changed my mind. I don't like this Yehawachas guy. He's he's you know, he's maybe he's, too, he's not he's not he's not as loyal as I want. I'm going to replace him with a different person. He replaces him with another son of Yoshiahu Amelach named El Yakim. Okay. And uh, just to skip, to, just to get to the story part a little bit, and then and then we'll we'll, we'll go back to this point in in time. So after after um, El Yakim, so." Pyro changes his mind again, and it goes to El Yaakum's son. Um, his name is going to be Yechonia. And then a- afterwards, Bavel takes over, and then the king of Bavel puts Sidkiyahu, who's a, n- a third son of Yoshiahu, on the throne, Machus Yud, and then it's going to be the destruction of the base of Migdash. So like, this, is like the, this is like the beginning of the end. Okay? So going back, when, when Pyro put El Yaakum on the throne, he did a very interesting thing. So he took Yoshiahu's son El Yaakum and says, he changed his name from El Yaakum to Yehoyakim. He changed the guy's name, the king's name, from El Yaakim to Yehoyakim. Okay. Now, that's a very interesting question because we're understanding how theophoric names work. And we understand how there's the element that refers to Hashem. And then there's the element that refers to you know, some sort of common, ne- common verb or noun that we're trying to say a specific lesson or an idea. And, we put, and you put the two together. Right? So here you have a name, El Yochim, which is a reference to Hashem, Kel. And then Yochim is like he establishes, he's the one who causes things to, to be everlasting and to be, to, to, be, you know, to, be, to be standing. And then he changes El Yochim to Yeho Yochim, which is also a reference to Yeho Hashem's name, and then Yakim, this idea of everlasting, standing, and, and establishing. So, so what exactly did Paro Nacho accomplish over here? He took the guy's name, which meant one thing, El Yakim, changed it to Yeho Yakim, which means the exact same thing. So what's he doing over here? If you, or if you didn't know about this whole concept of theophoric names, and you didn't look at names in this way, you would have never been bothered by the question. But now that we're bothered by the question, so what's the answer? Well, how, why did Pyro decide to change El Yochim to Yo what, what, What's he gaining? What, 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 what's, what's happening over here? So there's a sefer on Divra Yamim, on Book of Chronicles, called, I call it Pseudo Rashi. Because it, it, you know, it's printed in the Mikras Gedal, it says Rashi, but all the, all, all the consensus is that it wasn't written by Rashi himself. It was written by somebody maybe from the Beis Medrash or from the circles of Rashi, but not, not quite Rashi. So this pseudo Rashi, and this is, well, there's also this idea is found in the Rashbam in Chumash. Pseudo Rashi says that what, what Paro was trying to accomplish is there's this idea that when, when you come under the influence or you come under the domination of a king, so the king is going to try to do something to show that he's lording over you and you're subordinate to him. Okay? So we find this in multiple places in Tanakh. I'll give you examples in a moment. But ba- the basic idea is that what Paro Nacho is trying to do, he's trying to show, he's trying to put his foot down and show El Yakim, look, I'm the boss of, I'm the real boss over here. You think your name is El Yakim? No, your name is El Yakim. The, I, the, he didn't change anything, it didn't change any meaning. It, that's not the point. The point is not the, theman- the semantic meaning of the name. The point is, who gave you the name? Not your father. I'm giving you the name. Right? Uh, other names were, were people in Tanakh where you find that you know, when they came into the service of a king, so they got their name changed, was Yosef. When Yosef came under the service of the, of the Pharaoh, he became second in command. So he had to change his name, gave him a different name, Tzafnas Paneach, you know, a, a name in the, local, in the local language, an, an Egyptian name. And the same thing with Daniel, in the Sefer Daniel, when he was in the service of Nebuchadnezzar, so it says that, that Nebuchadnezzar gave him a Babylonian name. His name is not Daniel, it's Belteshazzar. That, that's the, that was Daniel's Aramaic name. Uh, and Daniel's friends, Hanani, Mishava, Azariah, right? so they were also in the service of the Babylonian king. He, also, he gave them also Aramaic names, or Babylonian names. Hanani, Mishava, Azariah became Shadrach, Meshach, and Avadnego. But, okay, so, so that's the idea. The idea is like, you know, we're changing your, I'm changing your name, I'm showing that, that you're subservient to me. Also, we find by, by when, when Yeshua ben Nun was, was serving Moshe Rabbeinu, so some of Farshim say that that's why Moshe Rabbeinu changed his name from Hoshea to Yehoshua. He's showing that, like, you know, I'm, you, you, who's the Talmud and who's the, who's the Rav? Right? That's like Hoshea and, and Yehoshua, the same, the sort of same paradigm. <coughs> so, but, like, why change the name 
in, the, in all these other examples that we said, maybe not in Hoshea and Yeshua, but like Yosef becoming Tzavnas Paner and Daniel becoming Belt Shatzar, you're changing the language, you're changing the meaning, okay, fine, there, there's something to that. But in the case of Eliakim becoming Yehoyakim, he didn't really change any meaning, he didn't change the language, right? So like, wh- what's he accomplishing? So there's a, good, there's a vart from the Ramad Vali, Rav Moshe David Vali, who was an Italian sage from the circles of the Ramchal. They, they say he was a Talmud Chover of the Ramchal. So he was, he was sort of a student of the Ramchal, but in a way he was a sort of colleague of the Ramchal. The Ramad Vali writes like this. It says that the idea is, what, what changed from El Yakim to Yeho Yakim? Just half of his name. Right? So the, 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 the Kel part changed into the Yeho part. So half of his name remained and half of his name is new. So the Ramad Vali explains that what Paro was trying to show him is that you only, you're, you're only halfway there because of, your own, because of your own, let's say, merits or your own genealogy. You're only halfway there because, because of who you are. But the other half is you're, you're king at my leisure. I'm the one who made you the king. Right? So like, it's like, you're, you're, you're half Yakim and then you're half a new, a new thing, you're half this. That, 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 that's, that's one vort that the Ramad Vali says. Another vort that the Ramad Vali says, and this gets a little bit more like Kabbalistic and mystical, says that we have different um, implications of different names of Hashem. The Zeredi Mufursim and Chazal, they say that the, shame, the four-letter name of Hashem represents Hashem's Midah of Rachamim, Hashem giving mercy. The, the name Elohim represents din. Hashem's mid of Din. The name Kel represents a concept of, ra, of, 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 of Chesed. So there's a difference between Rachamim and Chesed. Okay. Kel, Kel, so Hashem is Rachamim, Elohim is Din, Kel represents Chesed. There's a difference between Chesed and Rachamim. You know, we, we, we like to think like, okay, like Chesed is like Chesed and Rachman are like positive, and Din and Gvura is like negative, sort of something like that in the way we conceive things. But within the positive, there's two types of modes that Hashem has of Rachamim and Chesed. Before I explain what the difference between them is, I just have to clarify this because people mi- misunderstand this whole concept in general. So I just ha- I always whenever I mention this concept, I have to like clarify. The, of course, there's only one Hashem. And, you know, and there's only one master plan, and there's no changes in Hashem. Ani Hashem leish anisi. The, the prophet in Malachi says Hashem never changes. So there's no. It's not like Hashem is like he's, he's like this today, he's like that tomorrow. That's not how it works. W- how it works is that Hashem has multiple tools at his disposal, and these tools are not actual tools because Hashem doesn't have actual tools. These tools are perceived tools from our perspective. It looks like Hashem is using this tool or that tool. Right? The same thing with the spheres. The spheres, or these midas of Rachamim, or midas of Din, these are, these are from our perspective, it looks like Hashem is using this tool or that tool to achieve His one ultimate goal, His one ultimate master plan. Okay, there's, uh, people tend to confuse us, they think there's like something Din that's separate from Rachamim, it, it's not separate, it's all, it's all part of one Hashem. Are you, say, are you saying Hashem has different aspects to him? No. I'm saying people think that Hashem has different aspects to him. You can't, you can't say that Hashem has aspects to him. Because that's, that's taking Hashem, you're splitting the divine into multiple sub-divines. What I'm saying is that people perceive Hashem as acting in different ways in different situations. And we, we attribute that to different tools that Hashem uses. But Hashem is the same Hashem all the time. It's not like he's changing. It's from our perspective, it looks like he's doing something different. Gevura is just a way of him bringing chesed to the world. Right? And chesed is a way of him bringing gevura to the world. We don't exactly understand how all of that works together, but as is Hashem, be Yisrael Mashiach, we will. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Achad It means that in the, in the future we're going to understand exactly how Hashem and Elokeinu work together. Okay, so we're digressing, but we said there's two concepts. There's, uh, there's, there's Kel, which represents Chesed, and then there's Shem Havaya, which represents Rachamim. So what's the difference between Chesed and Rachamim? So it's like this. Chesed means that I'm going to give you something whether you deserve it or not. Okay, Whether you deserve it or not, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to do something good for you. Rachamim means 
you have some sort of some sort of redeeming quality. Some, some, there's something good about you, and I'm going to blow that out of proportion, and I'm going to give you something good based on that one little thing. Really, you don't deserve it. If, if, you know, if we go through like a din, 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 you wouldn't really deserve it. But I have racham, I have sort of, you know, they call it clemency. So I'm using that, that small thing that you really do deserve it to, to blow it out of proportion and give you something more than you technically would deserve. So chesed means you don't deserve it at all, I'm still giving it to you. And rachamim means I'm taking some little thing that you do deserve and I'm blowing it out of proportion and giving you more than you technically should deserve. So they're, they're, they're two slightly different ideas. So Ramad Vali says like this. There's a time for chesed and there's a time for rachamim. And Hashem is willing to say, you know, sometimes I'll do chesed. Sometimes I'll do chesed, whether you deserve it or you don't deserve it, I'll, I'll let you continue going. But now, in the time of Yoshia, who's children, now is not that time. Now, we're, we're getting towards the end, you're doing a Vayda Zara, it's getting too bad, it, 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 this is towards the end of the Bayes Rishon period, this is like the last 50 years of the Bayes Rishon, he's saying, El Yochim, which is, represents Hashem giving us, establishing Klal Yisrael through Chesed, that they don't deserve it at all, now is not the time for El Yochim. Now is the time for Yeho Yochim, which is, which is through Rachamim. You have to do something to deserve to be, you have to do something to deserve to continue existing. So, that, that, that's the, so, so the Ramad Vali says that Hashem, you know, Paro Necho, I don't think Paro Necho was, you know, realized this idea. He was just changing El Yochim's name to show, you know, to show who's the boss, who's the big cheese. But Hashem put this idea in his head to teach Klal Yisrael, you know, this is, this is the time. This is, you know, this is the situation right now. You know, this is the time to do tshuva. So that's, that's the Ramad Valley. This whole idea of El Yochim and El Yochim, if you didn't realize you know, that, that, that they mean the same thing, more or less, you wouldn't even bother by the question of Echol. You just think, okay, Paro changed his name. What's the big deal? That people change their name in Tanakh all the time. Um, what time is it? 10, Ten to two. Oh, wow. Six. Okay, we have a lot more to talk about, but, uh, okay. We'll let the camera keep running. Yeah, we'll let the camera keep going. Okay, let's say that. <laughs> um, like this. In, the, in, in, in archaeology, they found uh, the annals of the Assyrian king named Tiglas Pileser. The, the Assyrian king Tiglas Pileser, he was the one who, who basically sent the ten tribes into Gaulus. So this is going even before. This is going before the story of Yoshiyahu, before there were his, his sons Yehoachaz and, and, and the other guy, um, Eliakim and Yehoachim. This, this is before that. Uh, and in the annals of Tiglas Pileser, it says that he, he, he subdued the king of Yehuda named Yehoachaz and he made him pay a tribute to him. Now, the problem is that in Tanakh, it just doesn't line up. There's no King Yehoachaz who lived in the time of Tiglas Pileser. Right? There's, no, there's, there's no King Yehoachaz who lived in the time of, of, of Tiglas Pileser. In fact, if you look in Tanakh, the king in the time of Tiglas Pileser was named Ahaz, who was the father of Chizkiyahu right? Amalekh. So, why in the annals does it call him Yehoachaz and in the Tanakh he's called Ahaz? Right, in, in, so, 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 this, so this is an interesting question, right? It, it, it's sort of like a question of like archaeology versus Tanakh. In Tanakh it says his name was Ahaz, and archaeology says his name is Yeho Ahaz. It's like, what's going on over here? So I found two, two different people that address this question, and I have my own approach. The first one who addresses this question that I found was Rabbi Aaron Marcus, who was a very interesting fellow. Um, he, he grew, he, he, there's a biography about him. He lived about 100 years ago. He wrote a sefer called Kadmonius. And he lived about 100 years ago. There's a, there's a biography about him called The Chassid from Hamburg. So that already tells you something interesting about him. He was a scholar. He was very involved in like archaeology and, and Assyriology and things like that. And then he was also a Yeki and he was also a Chassid. Somehow all of that meshes together. And, and in his farm, they do actually mesh together in a very interesting way. What? Schizophrenic. Schizophrenic. <laughs> so, so he writes, he's the first one who addresses this issue, and he says that, the t that really his name was Yehoachaz, like it says in the annals of Tiglas Pileser, but the Tanakh 
took out the Yeho part of his name because this Achaz guy wasn't such a good guy. Chizkiel Melech, when his father died, when his Achaz died, he took his bones and he was like dragging his bones out on the street. And Chazal tells us that the Chachamim Hoiduloi, the rabbis agreed with what he was doing. This, this was an appropriate thing. That's what his father deserved. Right? So his father was not, Achaz was not such a good guy. So the Tanakh is sort of censoring the Yeho part of his name, taking that out, and just calling him Achaz, even though, as, as he was saying, like, as we know from archaeology, really his name was Yeho Achaz. That's one approach. Rabbi Victor Miller, in his book, Behold the People, says a very similar idea. He says, really, his name was Yeho Achaz, like it says in the archaeology, but that in his time, people were saying, this guy's not loyal to Hashem. How could we let him go around with a name like you know, Yeho Achaz, as if he's loyal to Hashem? Achaz meaning like, Achaz means to, to hold on to, right? This guy's not holding on to Hashem, Yeho Achaz. So just call him Achaz, take out the Yeho part. So it's a very similar idea. Also assuming that the archaeology one is like the right one, and then there's like sort of a polemic going on, whether Aaron Marcus is saying that the, the polemic was in, in, in the Tanakh, in I guess the Navi who wrote Sefer Melachim, which would, which would be Yirmiyahu and Navi, or the polemic was mitzad the people, that the people didn't like the fact that he was walking around with Hashem's name in his personal name, so they, the, the people themselves took out the name. I, 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 I'm uncomfortable with both of these approaches, and you, you probably see why, because both of them are assuming really the archaeological name is correct, and, and, and for other reasons, the Tanakh says a different name. Uh, really, his name is Yehoachaz, and for a different reason, it's, it's, he's called Achaz in Tanakh. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't like that approach. Um, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say such a thing on my own. I would say the opposite. I, would, I, I want to propose the opposite. Once we're just proposing ideas in the world. So just propose the opposite. I want to say, really, his name was Ahaz. And whoever wrote the annals of Tiglas Pileser, whether it was he himself or some you know, scribe or historian in his, in, his, in his court or whatever was writing the annals, the guy Pasha got confused. You know, all, there were all these, all these Jews going around with names Yeho this and Yeho that and Yeho this. So he assumed that, the, that, that this king named Ahaz, also his name was Yeho Ahaz. But he got it wrong. So why can't you say that? Now that, that, that's sort of my approach. Okay, these are different episodes in Tanakh that you can understand better with this idea of theophoric names in hand. Um, okay, now, w when did theophoric names start? So th this is very interesting because it's the only time that I, I, I saw from our, from our sources, from our farm, the Rishonim and, and the Ga'inim, that talk about theophoric names as like, you know, as the, as the the young people say, it's it's a thing. Right? What do you mean it's a thing? Where, where do you where do you see it? Come? Yeah, it, it it permeates all of Tanakh. But who who refers to it as a phenomenon in its own right? So the first person I see that discusses it is Rav Sadia Gain, and also Rav Yosef Bukh, Rav Yosef Bukhar Shor, who was a French Tosafist who you know who was from the circle of Rashi and Rashi's Talmidim in, in in France. who wrote a commentary on Chumash. So they both say like this. It says in Parshish Bereshis, after the birth of Enoish, it says, Oz hucha likre b'shem Hashem. Then they began to call in the name of Hashem. Oz hucha likre b'shem Hashem. Now, in my book, God vs. Gods, Judaism in the Age of Idolatry, published by Mosaic Press in 2018, available on Amazon.com and Feldheim.com, okay, um, in my book I talk about Oz hucha likre b'shem Hashem as referring to the advent of Avedah Zara. Others refer to it as the advent of prayer. They called out in the name of Hashem, like in prayer. Could mean they called out in the name of Hashem. They called you know, mundane objects in the name of Hashem. That's idolatry. But if Sadegain and Rabbi Yosef Bukhar Shor explain that this pasuk refers to the advent of this theophoric naming convention. From then, from the time of Enosh and onwards, they started calling people with, uh, with references to the name of Hashem in their personal name. And if you look at the names in the genealogical listings in Parshas Barashas, you'll see names like Mechuyael, you'll see names like Mesushael, Mahalalel, right? So all of these things are theoph or theophoric names, Mahalalel. Mahal, you know, the, the, the Sharish would be Hey Lamed Lamed, which is to give praise. So Mahal El, he is giving praising to who? To El, to Hashem. So the, the concept of theophoric names, according to the Rav Sadi and, and the Rav Yosef Bukhar Shor, already began you know, all the way from the, in, in, in Sefer Barashas, all the way in the time of Enosh. You know, there's like three generations into the creation of man. 
and as you would, if that's true, you would, as you would expect, um, you know, it predates the Torah, it predates Judaism, it predates Matan Torah, and so it's not a Jewish phenomenon, it's not a Hebrew phenomenon, but it's a global phenomenon. And it's something that you see all over all the world in all kinds of different cultures and in different milieus, you see them using theophoric names. Um, I can give you a lot of different examples. One example is, um, I mentioned Ugaritic before. Ugaritic is a language that's similar to Lashon HaKadosh, um, and it's, scholars consider it as part of the Semitic language family. Okay, what is Ugarit? Ugarit is a, is a city on the coast of the Mediterranean, north of Eretz Yisrael, in modern day Syria. And they found, archaeologists found in this city of Ugarit, or it's an ancient city of Ugarit, which is, you know, it's ruins now, they found all kinds of um, mythological texts and inscriptions and, and, and things like that that described this Canaanite culture and Canaanite mythology, Canaanite of Zara. And in all of those texts, you find there was a scribe there, his name was Eli Melech. There was a Ugaritic, uh, the Ugaritic is Avedah Zara, Canaanite Avedah Zara, Canaanite Avedah Zara, the guy's name was Eli Melech, right? So I would assume that it's a reference in, in Ugaritic mythology, so the, we, as we know that the Canaanim worshipped a god named Baal. That was the main god that the Canaanim worshipped. He was a weather god. And they also worshipped someone named Asherah, who was a fertility goddess. But they also believed in the s supreme god named El, who was like on top of Baal and Asherah. He was like the father of Baal, something like that. So this Elimelech, it sounds like a Jewish name. Like yeah, we have Elimelech in, in Megillus Rus, but it's also this Can it's also a Canaanite name, with, with a reference to the Canaanite god El, and also Melech. Right? So you have all kinds of examples of this. Um, you know, in, 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 there's a, there's a, in, in Arabic, they have a name, Abdullah. Abdallah. Yeah? What's Abdallah? So Abdallah, you know, as we said before, Arabic is very similar to Lashon HaKadosh. So Abd is a cognate of the Hebrew word Eved, Ayin Beis Dalet. So it's like servant. And then Allah is the Arabic cognate of the word Kel, or Elohim. Right? So Abdallah means Eved of Kel, or Eved of Elohim, Eved of Hashem, or Eved of, of the One God, right? So Abdallah is, you could say it's, 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 it's very similar to the Hebrew name Ovadia. And right? we have Ovadia, which is the same thing, Eved, and, and then Hashem's name. So Abdallah is sort of the same idea. And that is something you find in, 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 a, lot of different, in a lot of different cultures in the, in the ancient Near East. There's something called the Amarna letters, which was found in Egypt. Um, and it describes all kinds of correspondence between different Canaanite kings from like before Claudius all came to Eretz Israel and different Egyptian diplomats. And in the Amarna letters, there was a there was an, a, a king of the Amorim, and his name was Abdu Ashirta. Abdu Ashirta means Eved of Asherah. Okay, we said Asherah is this Canaanite goddess of, of fertility. Okay, so Abdu Abdu Ashirta. And we also have, you know, the, the, in, in Aram, they had, in Syria, they had a, a god that they, they worshipped in Avodah Zarah called Hadad. And, and there's people we have in archaeology named Eved Hadad. So it's this, this same idea. Hadad also appears in different characters in, from Aram that are mentioned in Tanakh. So the, the, the name of this god also appears in, their, in, in the name of these people. Hadad Rimon. Uh, Hadad Ezer, Ben Hadad, all kinds of characters in Tanakh that are from that area, that in their name, they have a reference to this, this Avodah Zaradik of God. And we also have Baal. We, as I mentioned before, the Canaanites worshipped a, a, a god called Baal. And in Tanakh we have, in Sefer Malachim, uh, Ahav, who was the king of Yisrael, married a lady named Izebel. And Izebel's father, if you have to go, you can go. I'm not, I don't want to hold you. What? Oh, it's competition. Not in, in this room or no? No, no. Okay, different room. Okay. So, um, I, I, so, so in, in the Tanakh, Izebel's, Izebel's father, his name is Etbal. So there you have a, a theophoric reference to this Canaanite god Baal. Um, could be also that Izebel herself See, in, 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 Can in Canaanites, so they worshipped someone called Baal, and the Babylonian equivalent of Baal, welcome, the Babylonian equivalent of Baal 
is called Baal, Bez Lamed. So in, in Canaanite it's Bez Ayin Lamed, and in, in Babylonian it's Bez Lamed. So we have, it could be that Izevel herself, is, her name has a theophoric reference to Baal, which is like the Babylonian form of Baal. We have Avi Baal, Eli Baal, Shafat Baal. Um, there's, a famous, uh, there's a famous general from Carthage. Carthage was a Canaanite <laughs> colony. His name was Hannibal. Hannibal is Chani Baal. Right? Chani is like, he gives grace, grace, Baal, a reference to Baal. So you have all of these people, you know, Goetia gr- gr- people, using theophoric references to Baal. Um, Belshazzar, who was the king of, of Bavel, the last king of Bavel, so his name is Belshazzar. Right? So also a reference to this Baal, and we said before, Daniel's um, Aramaic name was Belshazzar, that he got from Nebuchadnezzar, also seemingly with a reference to Baal. And they, both of these names, Bel Shatzar and Belt Shatzar, they both mean something along the lines of Bel is the guardian of the storage house. Something like that. Um, so w- w- there's, there's a lot of different examples, but I'm going to try to get to the point over here. Um, we have in Sefer Ezra and Nehemiah, there's somebody named Barkos. And this guy Barkos, is, his, his descendants were instrumental in helping build the second base of Migdash. And Chazal tell us that this guy Barkos, his name is an ugly name, but his deeds were good deeds. His maizim were good maizim, but the shame is an ugly, is a bad name. Right? So what does that mean? So archaeologists have revealed that the name of the, that the, of, of the deity that the people of Edom used to worship was something named Kos. So Bar Kos means son of Kos. So the name is, is, is a disgusting name because it has a reference to this Avodah Zarah of Kos that the people of Edom used to worship. But his deeds are, good, are nice deeds because they contributed to the construction of the Beis HaMikdash. Okay? So we, we, we see a sort of like, a, in, in, in this passage, we see a sort of like ambivalence towards, is it a good, is it legitimate to have is it, uh, let's say it like this. Is it a Jewish thing to have an, a name that has a reference to Avoid Zara in the name? Or is it not a Jewish thing? Like, Chazal said, like, it's, a, it's like an ugly name, but it's a good deed. It's like, that sounds like there's something wrong with the name, but it was a Jewish name, it seems. And then, it's not, not clear exactly how, 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 exactly to, how exactly to put it together. But, um, somebody wanted to say, Okay, uh, we'll, go, we'll go through another example. Um, there's another Babylonian deity that's mentioned in Tanakh. It's called Nergal. Okay, the context is that after the king of Ashur took the ten tribes into Golos, so what happened was that he took the, the Jews from the ten tribes, sent them into Golos, into the area of, of Samaria. He took them away from Samaria and sent them eastwards. And then he took people from the east, brought them to where the ten tribes used to live, where Malchus Yisrael used to live. He imported these people from the east, from Kusa, from other, uh, other areas, and he brought them into what, would, what was previously the area of Malchus Yisrael. And it says that they brought with them their various gods that they had in their native, in their native places. And one of those gods that's mentioned is something called Nergal. Okay? Nergal is the Babylonian god of death and disease and all, and all kinds of ugly stuff like that. Now, in Tanakh, also, when it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar coming to besiege Jerusalem, and it's talking about who, was, who were the different men that were part of Nebuchadnezzar's entourage, so there was a person named Nergal Sharetzar. Okay? <coughs> And there's also elsewhere in, T- in Tanakh, it talks about somebody named Sharetzar. And some of the Mephorshim want to say that Nergal Sharetzar is the same thing as Sharetzar, except that since Nergal is the name of Ovid Zara, so we censored the name Nergal and we just called him Sharetzar in, in the other place. Okay, so you see that like name that has a reference to Ovid Zara is like, it's not such a good thing. So we sort of censor it, we try to cover it up. Chazal criticized Bar Kos that he had an ugly name. Okay. Now, yesterday we asked the question, why is it that we all know somebody named Pesach? We have a, you have a friend, you have a relative, somebody named Pesach. Pesach Kron. Pesach Kron, right? There's a lot of people named Pesach. But, but we don't know anybody with the first name Sukkot. So why is that? 
sister-in-law is Sukkota. Sukkota, but not Sukkis. But and also, it's a, I mean, you you would have to admit it as well that it's a very very rare name. No, but you don't know anybody else named Sukkis, right? <laughs> so so I was bothered by this question. I, I couldn't find any any good answers. Um, I posted it on an online forum called Eitzra Chachma for different Talmud Chachamim to discuss different things, and some anonymous guy gave me a, gave me a gishmaka answer. He says that in that list when it talks about um, the Assyrian king bringing people from the east to take over Machlis Yisrael, the area of Machlis Yisrael, and each one brought their native gods with them. So one of the native gods that they brought with them was named Sukais Benois. That's the name of the god. The Chazal tells us that it was some sort of something in the form of like a hen with its chickens or something like that. I talk about it in my in my book God vs. Gods: Judaism in the Age of Idolatry, which has like an encyclopedia of different types of avodas that are mentioned in Tanakh. So this Sukkot Benois. So this guy wanted to argue that. Well, since Sukkot Benois is the name of an Avayda Zara, and it's inappropriate to have the name of an Avayda Zara as a person's first name, so we didn't, we, people didn't, we didn't want to get into it, so we don't give the name Sukkot as a first name. Even though Sukkot is the name of a holiday in the Torah, but it's also the name of an Avayda Zara, so we don't, want to, we don't give the name Sukkot as a first name. So we have Pesach, yeah, but Sukkot, no. That's what this person wanted to tell. That was a very interesting idea. But then if you, have to, if you think about it, it's like, wait a second, wait a second. Hold your horses. What, what's going on over here? Is that really true? That like, we don't want to give names of, of, of we had this Barkos guy, right? We have other examples in Tanakh of n- names that are, Esther, the name Esther is related to the Babylonian god, Is- goddess Istar which is another name for the Canaanite Ashtares, Ashtares, which is, um, you know, there's all, in, in, in all kinds of different cultures, the, the, the way the Avedazar worked out, they may have had different names, but it was sort of the same idea, the fertility goddess, right? So you have, in, in Canaan it was Ashtares, in Bavel it was called Istar, in, the Germ- in West Germanic tribes it was called I- Iostra, which is the etymological ancestor of the name Easter, right? Because the, the pagan holiday of Easter was, was, was honoring this fertility goddess. That's how it came about originally. And then the Christians sort of, you know, they took, they, they, they um, appropriated it so that they can get more people, and, and you know, it became a Christian thing. But it was originally a pagan holiday devoted to this, you know, the Germanic equivalent of Ashtores or Istar or whatever. But the point is that Esther... Esther Amalka, her name comes from this Avedah Zara of, of, of Istar, right? So you, you're going to tell me it's inappropriate to have a, a Jewish person with a name with a name that refers to Avedah Zara? Yes, she had a Hebrew name also, Hadassah, that's true. And Mordechai also, Mordechai is, a, is, is seemingly derived from the Babylonian god Marduk, who was known as you know, one, of the, one of the chief gods of the Babylonian um, pantheon. Yes, Mordechai also had a Jewish name, according to Ghazal, his name was Psachia, but he also went by Mordechai. Oh, in, in, in the Gilles Esther, we call him Mordechai. Right? So it's, it, it's hard to say that it's inappropriate to have a name just because that name refers to uh, Vaidazar. In fact, in Tanakh, in Sefer Divrei Yamim, it talks about Sholem Elach had a son named Eshbal, and he had a grandson named Miribal or Mirivbal. Okay? Now, both of these names, Eshbal and Mirivbal, have ref- theophoric references to the Canaanite god Baal, right? So how could it be? Shaul Amalekh, his, his son, his grandson, is going to have a name that has a theophoric reference to Avodah Zara. So you would say, okay, maybe it's maybe it's not so bad. It's just what, it's a name is a name. Nobody's thinking about like what the what the meaning of the, the origin of the name, the etymology of it. That's getting too lumdish. It's just a name. It's a nice name. It sounds good. So why not? What's the pro- what's the problem? And yet, uh, on the one hand, on the one hand, you might say that. On the other hand. In Sefer, in, 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 in Sefer Shmuel, by the way, both of these names, Eshbal and Merivbal, they're, they're attested to in archaeology. They found ar- archaeological um, stamps that have these names. So they, these, were, these names were actually in use. So, on the other hand, in Sefer Shmuel, when it talks about these two people, it gives them different names. Um, Ashbal is not called Ashbal, he's called Ishboishas. And Mirivbal is not called Mirivbal, he's called Mipi Boishas. Right? And so 
Shmuel Navi, when he wrote Sefer Shmuel, he sort of censored the Baal element of, of, of these names, because it's inappropriate, I guess, for a Jew to have a name that refers to the Avedah Zar of Baal, and switched out Baal for Boishas. Boishas is an embarrassment, it's a disgusting thing. Right? It's, a, it, it's, a, it's like a, it, it's making a macho, it's making a protest against, the, uh, against this Avedah Zar. So from Sefer Shmuel, it sounds like, it sounds like it's not appropriate to have, to have a, a theophoric name, a name that has a theophoric reference to an Avodah Zara. So it's not so simple, you know, to say that, oh, we don't use Sukkot because Sukkot was the name of this Avodah Zara. Even, even if it was, but so what? So it's very, it was very hard for me to find sources that really, like, touch on this topic. But I found the Machlokas Rishonim. I found the Machlokas There's a Sefer called... There's, there's a Rishon who lived in Aleppo in the, in the 1100s. His name was Rav Shmuel Masnus. He wrote a sefer called Bresh Zuta. He also wrote commentaries on Daniel and Devar Yamim and Ezon Chemia and Eov. Rav Shmuel Masnus, when he's talking about Daniel getting the name Belt Shetzar, right, which we said before is a theophoric reference to Baal, he says, you know what? It's not a problem to have a name that has a theophoric reference to a type of Avedah Zara. It's not a problem. It says even if Daniel wouldn't have been forced to take the name Belshazzar by Nebuchadnezzar, even if he would have been, if, even if he would not have been forced to take that name, it's okay to take such a name. Okay, that's what Rav Shmuel Masnus writes. On the other hand, Rav Yudah Chassid in Sefer Chassidim in Simon 194 writes the exact opposite. He says that, it, that Daniel who got the name Belshazzar, which has this the- Belshazzar, which has a theophoric reference to the Babylonian god Baal, says that in Sefer Yechezkel, Yechezkel mentions Daniel, but when Daniel appears in Sefer Yechezkel, his name is spelled without a Yud. Okay? So why is his name spelled without a Yud? So the Sefer Hasidim says, because it's coming to show Hashem's displeasure at the fact that Daniel got this name that has a reference to Avodah Zarah. So we take out the Yud. Yud represents Hashem, represents Hashem's name. So we take out the Yud to sort of show there was some sort of taina, there was some sort of protest or some sort of complaint against Daniel that he got this name that had a theophoric reference to Avodah Zarah of Baal. Okay? That's Rabbi Yudah Chassid. So you have here our Machlaikas. Rav Shul Masnus on one hand, who nobody's really ever heard of, but he says that it's not a problem. Rabbi Yudah Chassid, who says it is a problem. Okay, maybe you could say that we don't give the name Sukkos because we don't want to get into this controversy. You know, some people say yes, some people say no, so let's just not do it Bukhal. Oh, that's one approach. But that's, um, that, 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 that's one thing. There's an interesting piece from Rav Chaim Falachi. Rav Chaim Falachi asks, why is it that he, he, he's talking about this rebuttal chassid, saying there's a, there was some sort of taina on Daniel that he had this name Belshazzar, which had a theophoric reference to the name of of, of That Bel said, why is there only a problem with with uh, with Daniel? His friend Azaria, we said Chanani Mishal and Azaria, they also got Babylonian names: Meshach, Sheshach, uh, Meshach, Shedrach, and Avad Nego. Avad Nego is a reference, according to some of Farshim, to Nevo. So Nevo is also another Babylonian of Azar. So this is like, why, why, da, why, why only Daniel did Hashem have Tainaz on? Why not Azaria, who also got this uh, name which had a reference to Avedazar? So he says an answer, he says that because Nego is not really the same thing as Nevo, it's only an allusion to the name of the Avedazar, so it's more indirect, so it's not as problematic. But Belt Shetzar, which really uses the actual name of the Avedazar itself, the Bel, is, is part of his name, so that's more problematic. It is, I have a whole... You know, I have a whole list over here of different names, um, theophoric names that are in use nowadays that are names of Avodah Zarah. People are not necessarily makbid to you know, not give this name. Um, we mentioned before that the word you know, theophoric it comes from theo means, means God, right? So in Greek. So the word theodore, right? What does the word theodore mean? Theodore is, is, a, is, a, is a theo, it has the theophoric element of theo, meaning God. And Dor is like Doron. The word Doron is actually, people think it's like a Hebrew word or something like that. Actually, the word Doron is Greek. The word Doron means gift or present in, in Greek. So Theodore means the gift of God or a gift from God. Right? Chazal say that a carbon shlamim or a carbon oila is called a Doron. It's like a gift because you can give it voluntarily. You're not mukhuyiv, you're not obligated to give a shlamim or oila. You can give it as a gift. It's a Doron. Right? But, so the word Doron is, is, is a gift. So Theodore means a gift from God or a gift of God or God's gift. 
So you know, Theodore is a name that's, that you know, it's, it's in use nowadays. And it's a, it, 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 I, don't know if feel, I don't know if feel is really an Aveda Zara. It's more like, it, it's more like the concept of God in general. So it could be that it's not per se an Aveda Zara. By the way, you know, there's a female version of the, of the name Theodore. Dorothy. Oh, Dorothy. So it's the exact opposite. Yeah, we're not in, we're not in Kansas anymore. So, so, so Theodore is actually, if you think about it, Yesh po Mayer Vachshav? Yesh po Mashu? No? Okay, same. Uh, what? What time is it now? 6, 6, 6, 6, 6 Okay, so we have time. Um, so I'll just say a few, a few last words. Like, so it comes out that Theodore is actually the equivalent to, let's say, the Hebrew name Yonatan or Natanel. Right? Natanel. Shout out to my friend Natanel over here. Um, the camera guy. So Theodore is sort of like Natan, Natan Kel, Hashem, gave, the God gave, so Theodore, the God gifted, the God gave, different things like that. There's also a name Todrus in Chazal, which is a Hebraization of the Greek name Theodore. Right? So there, there was, a, there was, there was the, the Gemara talks about somebody named Todrus, who is Todrus Ish Roimi, who, the, 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 who comes up in the Gemara. Right? And so he had, a, he, had this, he had this Greek name, Theodore, but when you Hebraicize it, it back into the Russian of Chazal, it becomes Todrus. And Todrus is a name that people use nowadays. Even though it, 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 theoretically you would say like it has like a theophoric reference to Theo, which is God in Greek. But okay, that, that's not a problem. That's not a Vedizara per se. But then you have a name like Isidore, you know, which not in my generation, but like in the generation before me, you know, half the Jewish men were named Isidore, half of them were named Mars, right? So Isidore, what does Isidore mean? Isidore means Isidore is derived from Isis, which is the name of a Egyptian goddess, and Dor, which means gift. So the gift of Isis. So that, that, that that's a theo, that's Mamish of Zara, right? So how do you how do you have that name Isidore? It's Rashi What? Isis. Isis. Yeah, it's Rashi Tavis of the Islamic State, and but the Israelis call it Dash. So they, we, so it's a different. Um, yeah. So yeah, Isis was originally an Egyptian goddess that was worshipped by Greeks and Romans as well um, when the Greeks and Romans took over Egypt. Other other names that we use nowadays, Diane, Diana. Are, are, are names of, each, are, of are names of Roman goddesses, the Roman goddess of nature. Um, according to historians and etymologists, the names Mark, Marcus, Morris, Martin, and Marty are all derived from the Roman god Mars, right? And yet we we don't find the hakpada like okay we don't name your kid Martin, you know it, it, we, we, it's you know as I said before it, it, these are these are common these are common Jewish names. The names of Jewish people that we don't we don't have such a but Veronica and Bernice are are both derived from the Greek god Nike, or Nike, which is the god of victory. So Ber, Ber, Ver, uh, Veronica is like Vera Nike. Vera is like the true Nike, like the, the, the true. And I, I was I was corresponding with uh, Diane in Los Angeles, Rev Nisim Davidi, who's one of the Diane in the RCC in California. The best in California, and he wrote to me. You know, he does a lot of gitin, and he says to me, "There's a lot of names that are common in the Persian community in America. That these names are actually, if you look at the history and the etymology of these names, they are actually names of pre-Islamic Persian gods and goddesses." He gave me a whole list of names. I don't even know how to pronounce them, so I'm not going to pretend like I can pronounce them. But like, these things. They, they, they do still exist nowadays, and it's an interesting question. Like, you know, is it legitimate to, to give these? A, in English, we have um, there's a name Thurgood, yeah, Thurgood. So Thurgood means Thor is good. Thor is is, is the name of a Norse uh, Germanic god that the name Thursday is named after. Thursday is named after Thor, and Thurgood is Thur is good. It's like you could Thurgood. That, that that's like a Jewish name, like. Okay, I, I mean, I, I've never, never met any good Jews named Thurgood, but like, it, it, it just conceptually, like, is that is that a name of a desire? Ukrainian, what? Nike, the brand, brand Nike, is that where it comes from? Yeah, the brand Nike. So, so one one of the things that I'm selling over here, I have, I have an article in the Journal of Halachan Contemporary Society. I wrote about, you know, are you allowed to say the name Nike or Apollo or these type of things? You know, these are common common nouns that are derived from names of Avodah Zara, Greek and Roman Avodah Zars. So there's there's all kinds of there's 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 more examples. I skipped a bunch of examples already, and people are getting you know, antsy because they want to dive in already. So we're gonna we're gonna leave it over here. And thank you for, very much for coming. I just want to say 
um, before I finish that I don't have any copies of either of my books. I wrote two books. One on the history of the Hebrew language and other Jewish languages. It's called Lashon HaKadosh, History, Holiness, and Hebrew, published by Mosaica Press. I don't have any copies of it here, but it's available on Amazon.com and Feldheim.com. My other book is called God vs. God's Judaism in the Age of Idolatry. Again, I don't have any copies of that book with me, but you can get it on Amazon or on Feldheim.com. What? I don't, I don't have any in my house either, actually. It, it, I don't know how many copies that are left for sale in, in the Eretz Yisrael. It's like that's what I'm telling people to go on Amazon. I do have some back issues of different journals that I wrote articles in, and I'm selling them each one for $12 if you want to take a look at them. There's some interesting articles. And uh, thank you for coming, and thank you for staying. Thank you.